Well, good morning, Apostles family. Welcome to Sunday Worship. We're glad that you are here. Whatever your week has been like, whether you've been bothered or, or weighed down by events in the news or in this world, or maybe you've been bothered and weighed down by your own circumstances and difficulties and trials and loss in your own life, or maybe it's been a really great week and you're just excited to be here, you're ready to sing, you're ready to engage in God's Word, wherever you are, I'm glad you're here. The, the church body as, as a gathered people is a really important dynamic to our flourishing as a church and flourish, flourishing as individuals. We're, we're meant to be together. One of the difficulties of, of being online together is that we do miss something. There is a kind of suffering that happens when we can't physically be together. Nevertheless, God's Spirit still is ministering. He, he can overcome our limitations in caring for us as a church community. So. You're right where you're supposed to be today, gathered with other brothers and sisters, paying attention to the same thing, singing the same songs, praying the same prayers, trusting that the Lord will minister to us and give us what we need. So let me call you to worship. If you feel comfortable enough standing, I want to encourage you to do that. And I'm going to read from Psalm 145. And if you can just read the underlying portions with me. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. Let's sing. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. Search and know our thoughts and anxious fears. Wash us in the fountain of your mercy. Come with your light. We cannot hide from you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. With gratitude we raise our songs to you. Almighty God, to you 
while hearts are open. Almighty God, to you while hearts are open. Please pray with me. Almighty God, we confess how hard it is to be your people. You have called us to be the church, to continue the mission of Jesus Christ to a lonely and confused world. Yet we acknowledge we are more apathetic than active, isolated than involved, callous than compassionate, obstinate than obedient, legalistic than loving. Gracious Lord, have mercy upon us and forgive our sins. Remove the obstacles preventing us from being your representatives to a broken world. Awaken our hearts to the promised gift of your indwelling spirit. This we pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.
by the power of your grace. from John 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends 
for everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. As those who have been called friends of Jesus, let's practice Jesus' command to love one another now as we pass the peace of Christ. Let's pray. God, there's none like you. You are holy other, perfect and glorious. We magnify your name, calling out to our God most high. We pray to you today using King, da King David's words in Psalm 51. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions and our sin is ever before us. Against you, you only, have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Wash us and we shall be whiter than snow. Let us hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from our sins and blot out all our iniquities. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of our salvation, and uphold us with a willing spirit. Today we confess our need for you, Jesus. We have sinned in thought, and word and deed and need to be refreshed anew in the joy of our salvation. We turn to you for help to receive your mercy. Some of us and our neighbors feel as though our bones have been broken by a year of sickness and trial and are languishing. Self-salvation, safety schemes and comforts apart from you, Jesus, they all fall short and leave us wanting. Help us, God. Help us see our need for you in fresh ways that ready us for your healing and ready us to share the hope we have with any whose trials have exposed their need for a true savior too. Teach us your ways anew, ways of weeping, sacrificing, deepening our commitment to you and each other. Teach us ways of embracing obscurity and standing firm in our hope. Jesus, we are your people and we pray for image bearers all over the world experiencing deadly spikes in COVID cases, diminishing medical supplies, and low vaccine access. We pray particularly for the people of India and Brazil today. Hear our prayers and the prayers of our brothers and sisters there for healing, for care, and for saving faith among them. Jesus, we are your people, and we pray for image bearers experiencing injustice and abuse of power. We lament anything in our society and culture and in our own sinful hearts that would seek to diminish the image of God and others. We know anything good and right and true comes from you, so we ask that you would grant wisdom and humility to leaders and reformers. 
help us pray, help us repent where needed, and help us see each, each of us see more clearly where you would have us participate in your work of mercy and justice and reconciliation here and now. Finally, Father, would you cast out our fear of being or seeming weak? Help us see it as the way to you, to not be crushed by your discipline and our circumstances, but instead to see you at work and be part of your work. Today, Lord, open our lips and our mouths will declare your praise. With the preaching of your word, further press this church, apostles uptown to you, and to a thanksgiving to you for what you've done, and what you're doing among us, and your good purposes and where you've placed us. Bless us in your mighty name today, Lord. Amen. The reading from God's word this morning is John chapter 11, verses 1 through 44. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who had anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to Jesus, to where he was, and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always heard me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. 
When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we are in a sermon series that we've been calling This Church, where we are looking at certain values that shape the, the culture of our church. It doesn't just shape our mission, but it shapes the culture, right? There are certain commitments. We, we explained it this week. There, there are certain commitments that are common to most churches, right? Worship, evangelism, justice and mercy, missions, uh, community. The, the, these are common things that most churches are committed to. But there are certain things that are going on under the hood, things that often go unsaid, often unarticulated, that shape the culture. And we want to be explicit and intentional about what is going on under the hood. We don't just want to have gospel commitments. We actually want a gospel culture in our church community. It's, you know, it's this dynamic that if you go to a church website, you can see their doctrinal beliefs, their theological statement. You can see their ministry, what they're committed to publicly, but it doesn't define how you experience their church. You know, it doesn't explain why you can have a, a Bible-believing, doctrinally faithful, orthodox church, but when you go to their church, what you experience is a very toxic and abusive culture. Why is that? Well, there are things that are going on under the hood. And what we want to do is try to be explicit and intentional about what is shaping our culture. And we talked about this last week, or we began last week with the first value, which is renewal. We want renewal, a, di- a renewal dynamic, a biblical view of renewal to be shaping the culture of our church. And we defined renewal like this, is when a person or a church community recovers a lived experience of God's power and his benefits. When a individual or a whole community, church community, recovers a lived experience, not just an intellectual knowledge, but a lived experience of God's benefits and his power. And, and what we said last week is that is actually probably the most important value of our church. That is what we aim for and where most of our ambitions are centered around is for each one of us in our church community to have a lived experience of God's power and his benefits. This week, we want to look at our second value, which is depth. Depth. Now, what we mean by depth is that in our preaching or in our teaching or in our ministry or in our comforting or in our counseling or whatever our church is doing, we want it to make sense of the human experience in, in a way that has integrity to it. We want to resist trite and superficial explanations and answers to sin, to suffering. We, we, we want to speak to one another in a way that makes people who are suffering to go, oh, yes, that's right. Or we want victims to be able to say, yes, they get it. They understand. We want to resist treating people as if they're one dimensional. We want to treat them like complex, made in the image of God, beautiful people that each one of us are. Something more, we're talking about something more than just intellectual depth or theological depth, though that's important to this. But we're looking at also emotional and relational depth. Emotional and relational depth. And we're not just talking about something for pastors or leaders in our church. This is actually, the New Testament seems to have a vision for a whole community to have a depth of ministry to it, to be shaped this way. Now, Jesus, of course, is the best example to look at, and there are many stories to look at where Jesus seems to have theological, emotional, and relational depth in the way that he ministers to people. 
But the story we're looking at today is John 11, which is this famous story where Jesus raised his, raises his friend Lazarus from the dead. Now, he enters this scene, right? After he hears that, that Lazarus is sick and he waits a few days and he comes into this scene where, Je- where Lazarus has now been dead for a few days and everyone is weeping. And, and what we see, Jesus, right off the bat is not interested primarily with solving problems and answering questions. He's here to minister grace and love. Yes, he heals Lazarus from the dead, but actually a closer look here in this passage, we see that there's more than just one kind of healing going on. Jesus shows that people are not simply problems to be solved, but they are ones to be present to, to comfort, to love, and to listen to, mysteries to be explored. He shows in this passage, not just theological depth, which we'll get to and is important, but emotional and relational depth. So there's a pattern here in in the way that Jesus engages with people that we ought to be following, each one of us. And and, and the first part of this pattern is theological depth. He does provide a theological depth from what's going on, right? In verse 25, Martha, he runs out to meet Jesus who's coming into the scene, and she says right off the bat, Jesus, if you would have been here, none of this would have happened. He wouldn't have died. And Jesus says, Martha... I am the resurrection and the life. Do you know who I am? I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, shall yet live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, what's important here is is that Jesus is putting Lazarus' death in the context of something bigger than his own story. There is a bigger story and a bigger narrative that Lazarus' death is a part of. Martha was concerned that Jesus was just too late to do anything about the the death of his brother Lazarus. And, And she's not only thinking about this moment in the context of of, of, of what Jesus has in mind, she's thinking about this moment in the context of the immediate urgency, right? A few days ago, Lazarus got sick. And if Jesus had been here only a few days, had been here in time, none of this would have happened. He could have stopped all of this from happening. And here comes Jesus putting the, the narrative of these few days that, that, that Martha is so consumed with, he's putting the narrative of these few days in the context of God's story. There's something bigger going on that Lazarus' death is a part of. There's a larger story. De- Jesus doesn't just heal people. He doesn't just resuscitate the dead like he does with Lazarus. There is coming an actual resurrection where death dies. In Christ, someday death will end. Death and sickness will not have the last stay. Because at the end of the story, Jesus does raise Lazarus from the dead. He walks out of the tomb and he's returned to his brothers and his sisters and his friends. But Lazarus, we know, dies again. He's not still alive. He's in some grave. His hope, he's still waiting for a better hope. The larger narrative isn't that You and me, in our own lives, the larger narrative is not simply that we're waiting for a better job. We're waiting for our circumstances to get easier. We're waiting for COVID to end. Or we're waiting to have more money or or a better apartment or a bigger apartment or a new mayor or whatever hope that we may try to put ourselves in. That is not the, the, the biggest story, the larger narrative, we are waiting for the resurrection of the dead. That's what we're waiting for. That's what we're hoping in. 
And Jesus has the theological depth and the ability to put our lives and our community in the context of God's story, not just the immediacy of our situation, whether it's good or bad. And we ought to have that theological depth too. We ought to have the theological depth to put our circumstances and our stories in the larger narrative of what God is doing. And actually, all other comfort comes from that depth. All comfort comes from the theological depth and being able to say, death doesn't have the last say. The challenge for us is, is that for many people, when we're thinking about comforting and caring or being present to those who are going through loss or going through grief or confusion, this is as far as we go. Theological depth is as far as we go. You know, if, if we have friends who are experiencing loss and grief and pain, the best we often offer is a theological explanation of what's happening, right? Someone loses a loved one. Well, they're going to rise again. Right? You lost a job. Well, God is in control. You're lonely. You're, you're single and you're lonely. Well, you know, you're the bride of Christ. All of those are true. But what those things do, those truths do, they only provide the ground for further comfort and ministry. Theological depth and explanation provides the context to provide deep care and deep healing and deep love. Theological depth only meant that this isn't hopeless. right? If, if there was no resurrection from the dead, Jesus wouldn't be able to come in and offer much comfort. He would just say, yep, this is probably the worst thing that could happen. But his theological depth actually provided him the context to go deeper than just giving theological explanations. I was ministering at a funeral. Another pastor and I, we, we both had friends who had lost um, a child and we were both leading this funeral together. He was preaching that I was going to follow after him. So he began his sermon at the, the funeral with this grand, deep, rich explanation of the resurrection that the story of this child has not ended. There's coming a greater hope for this, res for this child, and it's the resurrection of the dead. It's not the last story of these parents. It's not the last story of this community. It's not the last story of this child, and it was great. He was giving a grander narrative to what felt like a hopeless story of a dead child. And now I had to follow this sermon. So what do you do? How do you follow a sermon like that? Well, you don't. I couldn't just say the same thing but there was something else needed in this moment. There wasn't just theological depth that was needed in this moment. There actually needed to be some emotional depth. They needed something more than just a theological explanation of what has just happened to their child and what will happen to their child. And so I followed and I gave a, a short little talk on how Jesus welcomed little children. When everyone around Jesus thought children were not important enough to be around Jesus, Jesus says, no, 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 actually, the kingdom of God is meant for people who have the posture of little children. And he welcomed them into his arms. And the whole point of the sermon was, Jesus has everlasting arms and he's welcoming this child. It's not the end of the story because Jesus welcomes little children. He has everlasting arms for us. And actually, this little child is a pattern on how we are actually received by Christ, who loves us. We don't need to know just that death is not the last story. We need to know that Jesus is actually present to our pain. And He loves us. There is an emotional depth, which is what Jesus here does. He presses not just into a theological explanation, but he presses into emotional depth. Now Mary, the other sister, runs out and finds Jesus. And in verse 33, 
She again asks, why, why didn't you come? Why weren't you here? And it says, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her, they were, all, they were also weeping. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. In verse 35, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Now, I find it so remarkable that Jesus weeps here because he knows, he knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He should impulsively say, listen, stop weeping. Stop crying. Don't be sad. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I'm able to do? Stand back. But he doesn't do that. Why is he crying? Because again, he is looking to heal more than just the dead body of Lazarus. He's looking to be present to their grief. Because we know intellectually that Jesus will, will raise our friends from the dead. We know that losses of jobs and money is not the end of the story. We know that. But we need to know and experience the love of Christ. We need comfort. We need ministry. And Christ here puts himself in the way of their sadness. He doesn't want them to be alone. He doesn't want, he doesn't want to be aloof to their sadness. He doesn't just want to wait till they're done and then he can perform their miracle. He puts himself in the way of their sadness. Jesus here shows us, uh, I just wonder if sometimes we sort of think this, some very serious religious people oftentimes think that grief is a lack of faith and sadness is sin. But Jesus here shows that grief is not a lack of faith and sadness isn't sinful because Jesus is showing both emotions. He wasn't afraid of experiencing this, these difficult emotions. He wasn't afraid around people who are experiencing these difficult emotions. He doesn't do what we often do when we get around people who are experiencing difficult emotions that we just want to quickly cheer them up, quickly resolve the tension, quickly get past the problems. He wasn't too important to just sit with people in their grief. And that should be our desire too, is to be okay just sitting with people in their grief. Now, this is really important to know. That means that Jesus' main ministry in your life is not to keep difficult things from happening to you or to keep you from experiencing difficult emotions. That is not Jesus' main ministry to you, and that shouldn't be our main ministry to one another. That's not how we care for one another. That's not how we're present to one another. There is a difference between just trying to make people feel comfortable and pursuing a ministry of comfort. There is a difference between just trying to make people comfortable and pursuing a ministry in comfort. And the difference between the two is emotional depth. And the difficult thing for us to realize in the grasp is that when difficult things happen and we experience difficult emotions, that is the context in which Jesus does much of his work. That's the context in which he does much of his work. But not only that, he not only does theological depth, he not only does emotional depth, but he also does relational depth. Yes, he puts himself in the way of their sadness because he was doing something deeper than just raising someone from the dead who would soon die again. But it's important to see that Jesus was driven by love. But in order to be present to, to love Mary and Martha, Jesus actually had to resist the anxiety and the expectations of the crowds. Verse 37, people, are, they're, they're watching Jesus and they said, he, he, he healed people all, all throughout his ministry. He has healed the deaf. He's healed the blind. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus 
was involved in a ministry of presence and comfort in this moment, and the crowds were interpreting it as inactivity and indifference and missing the point. Jesus was doing something. He was being present to the sadness and the grief of Mary and Martha. And what the crowds were doing, they were interpreting that as inactivity, indifference, or missing the point. They were expecting a kind of efficiency, a kind of productivity in Jesus that Jesus didn't seem to be interested in at all. He wasn't driven by anxiety or the desire to please those around him. He was free to love. Now listen, we are all ministers of the gospel. If you are a part of this church, if you are a Christian, the New Testament calls you a priesthood of believers. You are a gospel minister. And so this is for you. This text and this pattern is for you. It's not just for pastors. It's not just for deacons. It's for you. If we want to follow Jesus, Jesus here shows us what it means to be a non-anxious presence. Jesus wasn't anxious. He cared more about loving Mary and Martha than he did about pleasing the crowds and taking away the tension in the room. Do you know? Do you see? So how do we follow Jesus? Because the New Testament does call us to follow Jesus, to pattern our life after his life, to minister in the way that he ministered to love the way that he loves. But the the pattern of the New Testament in order to follow Jesus is not just to see what Jesus does and then to say, okay, that's what I have to do. Because if we just follow Jesus' example, we will be crushed by the expectation and the burden of following a perfect life. That won't work. That is not what we ought to be doing. That's not how we follow Jesus. What we actually do is look for where Jesus found resources to minister and live in the way that he did. Now remember, right, if, if, if we are in Christ, what belongs to Jesus belongs to us. What is true of Jesus is true of us. So we go to where Jesus found resources and power to minister in the way that he did. And if you look at verse 41, it says that Jesus began to pray. He says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you would always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. We can unpack a lot of that phrase. But what is important to see is that the power behind the ministry of Jesus, the power of his healing and his love and of his comfort was his relationship with the Father. That was the place of power. With the Father, he doesn't have to have a relationship of doing for the Father in order to be loved with the Father. He had a relationship dynamic of being with the Father because the Father loved him freely. He didn't have a relationship of In order to be with the Father, I have to prove myself to the Father. I have to prove to be lovable, prove to be worthy. He had a relationship with the Father where he could be with the Father because the Father loved him. Because Jesus was his son. He was the beloved one in whom the Father is well pleased. And it was free. It was free love. It was a dynamic that he didn't have to prove himself to be Loved And listen, remember, when we are in Christ, what belongs to Jesus belongs to us. We have this dynamic, this relationship with the Father, to be with the Father because the Father loves us like he loves Jesus. That's the kind of relationship that we have. In other words, Jesus is living on a spiritual surplus that is based on his regular and intimate and free communion with the Father. Now listen, the the reason for many of us why we consider 
and, and thinking about trying to love and provide ministry of comfort with relational depth and emotional depth, the reason why that oftentimes feels impossible and not being able to accomplish that is not because we don't have the resources, is because we are running on a spiritual deficit. It's not because we don't have what Jesus has. It's because we are running on a spiritual deficit. We oftentimes live as if we're trying to earn from the crowds what we should be receiving freely from the Father. We live as if we are trying to earn from the crowds what we should be receiving freely and by grace from the Father. In other words, When we walk into settings like Jesus did, the setting of of Lazarus's gravesite where everyone has expectations, right? And maybe for us, it's when we walk into meetings at work or maybe when we walk into our community group, whatever it is. If we walk into those settings with a kind of spiritual spiritual deficit, we will feel the overwhelming weight to satisfy the expectations of others impulsively before we will feel the freedom to love others. If we walk into rooms where we ought to be loving and serving others freely, but we walk in with a spiritual deficit, we will feel the weight of the anxiety and the expectations of others first. What Jesus shows is that if we walk into settings like this with a spiritual surplus of a loving intimacy of God who loves us, not because we're impressive, not because we're, we, we, we've accomplished so much, but because we're his sons and daughters, when that is the case, we can freely love and not be driven by the expectations and the anxieties of those who are around us. This is a kind of freedom that Jesus has and is available to us, which is why last week we talked about, first, renewal dynamics, right? This is so important. When we recover a lived experience of the power and the benefits of God, this lived experience of gaining a spiritual surplus, We have the freedom to love deeply, to comfort deeply without the fear of fulfilling the expectations and the anxieties of the crowds. I mean, do you you see here? Here's the invitation. Jesus is giving us a model of fruitful, of a fruitful and loving life. Where, where people experience his healing presence. And the New Testament actually calls us to follow his pattern, follow his life. And Jesus here is showing the power. I have a spiritual and relational and emotional surplus with the Father, so I don't have to seek out that surplus in the crowds. I have a surplus with the Father so that I don't have to seek it out in the crowds. And Jesus here is inviting us to follow him there. I mean, this is what he says in John 17, that the love that he has with the Father, we are actually invited into. The same experience of divine love, freely given, we're invited into. That means... Jesus says, look, I have, I have the, the power of a fruitful, vibrant life. And that power is based on the communion I have with the Father. So come with me. Come with me into this power, into this fruitful, vibrant life. And this is based on a principle that's important to know. There is no following Jesus apart from abiding with Jesus. There is no following Jesus apart from abiding with Jesus. You can't try to pattern your life after him without reaching for the spiritual resources and power that he reached for. It doesn't work or else his his life will just be a crushing burden, a crushing weight. We'll never be able to live up to his example, nor will we have grace and resources for when we fail. 
look, do you see the, the two the two values that we've shown so far, which is renewal and depth, are meant to define and shape our church, that we are pressing into renewal dyna dynamics to have a lived experience through worship, through community, through everything that we're doing. We want to have a lived experience of the power and the benefits of God so that we can have emotional and relational surplus in order to, to serve and to love and to comfort and to minister to those around us. That's why we pray. That's why we, that's why we sing. That's why we, we, we look at God's word. We want to have a, a, a renewed understanding, a grasp, a lived experience of all the benefits and the power of God so that we can go into every situation with a spiritual surplus and love freely, just like Jesus did. All right, let's pray. Father, we ask for help that you would give us the power given by your spirit to love freely, that we might be a community with a spiritual surplus. We have a lived experience of the benefits and the power of God because that's what Jesus has. That's what's granted to Jesus and it's granted to us. So we ask for help. Give us mercy. We need mercy. Help us to follow Jesus and abide with Jesus. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, friends, let's sing.
the bleeding one Cling to his side Cling to the rising one In him abide Cling to the coming one Hope shall arise Cling to the reigning one Joy lights thine eyes Oh, cling to the crucified Jesus the Lamb who died Cling to the crucified Jesus the King Cling to the crucified Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. As we continue to sing, and as we use this time to worship through giving, let us cling to Christ. The one who took on our flesh knows our weakness and our humanity, yet who is interceding even now on our behalf. Let's sing.
thousands of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battles Well, let's pray together. Father, we know that we are not alone. We are filled with your spirit. We have your presence. We know that those who are for us are greater than those who are against us. And so we just ask for help. We ask for mercy, that we would be aware and awake to everything that we have in Christ, all the power and resources and benefits that we have in Christ, so that we won't have fear, so that we won't grow weary, so that we will persevere, we'll have endurance, we'll be sturdy as a church community. So I just pray for an awakening of that, Father. Give us a grasp, a lived experience of all the power and benefits that are in Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it was good to sing with you and be with you today. If this was your first Sunday, or maybe it's one of your first Sundays and you have questions about the church, you want to get connected, uh, you have questions about Jesus or the Bible or faith or whatever it may be, maybe we can serve you in some way. There is a connect box on the top of the screen. You could just click on that. A form will come up and you can just fill out any information that you're comfortable giving, clicking any appropriate boxes. Or maybe we can just pray for you. You can put a prayer request in there and we would love to be able to serve you or connect with you in some way if you're able. Well, um, if you are a member of this church, if you're a part of this church, if you call Apostles Uptown your home, I want to encourage you to continue on in your generosity. We are in the weeks of building out our budget and planning our budget for the next year. And so far this year, our church has been really faithful and generous in a time of a lot of questions. Um, some of you have been generous when others couldn't. Um, so we want to thank you. We want to encourage you to continue on in that way. So, um, you know, Jesus tells us to be generous in the mission of the church. That means we're generous with our time. We're generous with our gifts and we're generous with our money and our resources. So we want to encourage you, especially just if you're a part of our church, um, to continue on in that generous spirit for the financial health of our church community. Um, on, and from that, just want to remind you on May 2nd, we are going to be gathering again together in person. So um, be prepared for that. There is an RSVP. You can RSVP, let us know you're going to be there. And we're going to make all the appropriate precautions to keep a safe place to worship together. Um, but I want to encourage you to RSVP to that. And if you're present and able to be, to be with us on that Sunday. And also, um, related to Sundays, we need to start building out our serving teams. And so if you were on a serving team previously, before the city shut down and we couldn't meet together in person, you're going to receive an email just to see if you're interested in serving on that same team or maybe to serve on a different team. We need to start building up these teams again in order to make Sundays happen so all the burden isn't just left on a few people who seem to serve quite a bit. So we want to build up these teams. So if you are have been on a serving team and you're going to receive an email in the coming days, just respond back to that email um, and, and tell them, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be on a team again. Or maybe you're new and you've, you've never served on a team. Just let us know that you're interested if you are to help build out these serving teams for our Sunday. And you can do that by uh, filling out one of those connect cards that we talked about earlier. Just click on the connect, fill it out, and just let us know that you're willing to be on a team. And that'll be a huge benefit to our church community. All right, friends, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. So there's going to be a Lord's Supper link to our Zoom call. You can just click on that and have your bread and your cup available. And we'll see you over there.